As long as human beings remain human beings, they are going to be interested in some form of prognostic knowledge. We all have a feeling somewhere deep within ourselves that some regulating force exists in the universe. We live in a planned kind of existence. And while the human being is forever resenting the domination of natural law, he learns to his sorrow that he cannot deny such law or violate its principles. Our remote forebears sought for some scientific approach to a knowledge of the shape of things to come. And most of them, whether in the East or West, came to the conclusion that the most reliable, or at least the most reasonable possibility for a valid prognostics could be found in the rhythmic, orderly motion of the heavens. From very early time, man observed the effect upon the earth of the progression of seasons. And uh, they came to the conclusion that there was at, one, at least one very simple prognostic that no one was going to deny, namely, that 2,000 years from now, winter will be in the wintertime. There's just no answer to this. We have a right to predict frosty weather in all regions to which such predictions could apply between January and March. This is because our relation as a planet to the solar system of which we are a part regulates climate. Now this uh, regulation of climate certainly also carries other implications. If we watch the statistics, we shall see that in adverse climatic seasons, certain types of sickness increase. We also realize that when these seasons produce hazardous weather, accidents follow. In early medical research, we discovered also that the seasons of the year affect the basic vitality of man, that near the winter solstice his vitality is lower, and those of enfeebled constitution uh, suffer correspondingly. Then also, these early physician scientists began to take consideration of what we call epidemics. Epidemical disease seemed to follow patterns, although not always within the narrow structure of a year. Epidemics follow certain events in nature uh, with a, uh, astonishing regularity. Uh, the astrologers came to the conclusion that ordinary materialistic scientific knowledge uh, could not adequately predict uh, ep an epidemic. Uh, that uh, perhaps we might expect the common cold to be more frequent in inclement seasons. But we could not predict from our common knowledge the great plagues that swept Europe. We could not predict the influenza epidemic that at the time of World War I took more lives than the war. Furthermore, when epidemical ailments do arise, we do not know what finally stops them. No one stopped the great plagues. No one really stopped the influenza epidemic. No one really stops an outbreak of polio or anything of that nature. Perhaps we can learn how to prevent such epidemics, but we have no way of knowing how they are going to run their courses. Yet even in areas where scientific skill is unavailable, 
where great plagues sweep over a continent, these plagues finally seem to die of themselves. They come in a relationship to some other pattern of laws, and they subside. We also realize that the story of human religion follows very definite cyclic patterns. Spengler in his Decline of the West shows the parallels between several great world cultures. We may attempt to explain these things entirely from a psychological point of view, but there seems to be more. In fact, our psychological findings themselves are based upon some moving process in the universe. So everywhere this motion is relatively clear, although we are not always able uh, to fully understand it. Uh, we, the world has been divided for a long time into two great schools of thought, one of which may be termed Asiatic and the other Western. Long ago, at the time when science was in the building in the West, that is, we'll say, from the rise of Greek culture uh, down to the Renaissance in Europe. During this long period, men were attempting in one way or another to increase their basic knowledge of existence. But in the Western world, this knowledge of existence was strangely restricted and limited. If we consider the long picture of Western culture, we will realize that it was not until after the Renaissance that Western man began to glimpse the magnitude of the universe in which he lived. In order to make these discoveries, many brilliant leaders had to suffer persecution and even martyrdom. The world was not quick, the Western world at least, to accept the findings of Galileo or Copernicus. And they persecuted such individuals as Savonarola, very largely because he dared to suggest that the stars were not candlesticks set in the sky to light the ways of Western man. Our concept of the universe was very small. Our universe was very largely the Mediterranean area. We believed, even as late as the time of Columbus, that if man sailed west from the coast of Europe, he would finally come to a great uh, abyss into which his ship would fall into eternity. We also had very restricted attitudes concerning time cycles. We assumed that the earth was only about 5,000 years old in those days. We assumed that man had been a unique creation fashioned according to the biblical injunctions. Thus in Europe we had uh, really a very cramped world in which to live. Outside of the orbit of Saturn was a great wall set with constellations and beyond that wall was heaven with the angels and archangels and divine beings. Uh, the universe of modern astronomy was very dim in those days, and the old maps and things of that nature would indicate that we believed broadly that the world and the earth was flat, we believed that it had corners, and also that it was a little island floating in chaos, and that outside of it there was very little of real importance. Pythagoras intimated something of the solar system, but his ideas did not find very fertile ground. On the other hand, in Asia, it was quite different. Uh, long before the rise of science in Europe, uh, Asiatic peoples, particularly in India, and a little later in China, came to amazing intuitional understanding of the universe. Certainly their maps were not much better than ours. They had some very strange-looking cosmological schemes, uh, which uh, perhaps were not a vast improvement over the old opinions of Ptolemy. But there was this difference. To the east, the universe was an immensity. Uh, the Chilicosms recognized in the old Buddhist writings, for example, indicated that this diffusion of life in which we existed was made up of thousands of solar systems, cosmic systems, universal systems. 
that all of these systems could be populated by intelligent creatures, that these universes could uh, rise uh, in cultures, uh, could ascend in knowledge, and that great spiritual leaders existed everywhere in space, not only on the earth, but that every great culture on some remote planet far off in a little solar system that we cannot even see could very well bring about a culture as great as our own, perhaps far greater. So that the East had this sense of immensity. Uh, to them, uh, existence extended uh, to the borders of universal being itself, and by a delightful symbolic gesture, they said that not only did it extend to the boundaries of infinity, but six inches beyond. Now, the six-inch part <coughs> was rather delightful, but it does have a, a broadening effect. As a result of this general attitude, the philosophies and religions of the East were not primarily concerned just with man. They did not regard man as a unique thing or being in nature. They regarded all of the works of men as being merely a small fragmentary part of a vaster labor. And from this general attitude, which was keenly intuitive and perhaps bounded, uh, founded upon their natural meditational and contemplative way of life, at least these old sages looking out at the broad heights of Himavat and the great snow glaciers uh, which circled northern Asia, were aware of vastness, were aware of immensity, and were aware that God had to be a God of immensities, that universal laws had to be laws moving through immensities, and whatever the powers were that regulated things, these powers had to be inconceivably great. All this together led to a marked division between Eastern and Western thinking, a division which has never been entirely um, uh, brought together or coordinated, although most of our modern scientific findings have been inclined to support the Eastern concept of the immensity of cosmos. In the West, however, Plato, perhaps more than anyone else at that time, began to think of the heavens as a vast clock or a great calendar that this clock measured not merely the days and hours that we know, but the great days and the great hours of the universe, that there was a kind of cosmic timetable, that there were the recurrent patterns and restatements of the <coughs> clusterings and groupings of stars, that once the time of their cycles had been estimated, uh, these estimations could be projected infinitely into the future, very much as we now can do by means of adjusting the machinery in a planetarium. We can create a pattern of the heavens for any date over a great period of time, perhaps a million years to come. Even our friends down in Central America had a calendar that thought in terms of hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, these larger concepts uh, perhaps came gradually to the attention of the stargazers of the West. Contact between Asia and the Near East was greater than we realize, and along the caravan routes and the old silk roads, uh, a great deal of wisdom went back and forth. The East gained a knowledge of our practical skills, and the West in turn began to sense uh, the abstract philosophical speculations of Eastern nations. It is certainly upon the basis of these larger speculations about existence that the idea of the precession of the equinoxes, as described by Plato, uh, came into favor. The equinox, of course, represents, the vernal equinox, represents the time of the entry of the sun into the sign of Aries, hypothetically, at the beginning of the solar year. The equinox is the crossing over of the sun uh, into that cycle of its annual existence, which is concerned in the production of spring and summer, 
uh, and gradually leads to autumn and the fulfillment of the harvest. This equinoctial point retires through the zodiac at the rate of one degree every 72 years. We know this to be a scientific fact. Therefore, we have a way of dividing the great clock of time into 72-year patterns or cycles. Uh, these repeat themselves uh, 12 times to form what is known as the great platonic year, or the time it requires for the sun uh, to come back again to any given point at the vernal equinox. This tremendous platonic year uh, became, I think, the basis of our first effort at broad range prediction. The motion of the sun through these signs producing the phenomenon of the moving equinox meant that each time the sun uh, passed from one sign to another in its processional motion, uh, the world events began to take on the color of that sign, just as a person born with the sun in Leo has certain characteristics. So the world, while the sun passes through the sign of Leo at the vernal equinox, has certain characteristics. And these characteristics constituted ages, or periods of time. And following the concept of Plato, we can uh, find in our little booklet on this subject that by astronomical calculations, the ancients discovered the duration of the great year of the precessions. And this great year was 25,920 years of man's time. Uh, this they referred to as the divine year, or the year of the gods. And Plato makes allusion to this cycle so frequently that later writers have uh, frequently referred to it as the great platonic year in his honor. In the This great platonic year is made up of 12 months or 12 uh, divisions or parts, the time being for each of them the length that the sun at the vernal, uh, vernal equinox remains in the same sign. And this lesser uh, division, which might be almost termed the 12 months of the Platonic year, is made up of 12 periods, each containing 2160 years. At the end of this great platonic year of uh, 25,920 years, uh, we have what we might almost term our concept of the equivalent of one uh, earth year, where it would mean that it would be the time between Christmas and Christmas, or between Easter and Easter. It would tie up the pattern of the year and bring the sun back again to the repetition of the great pattern. Now our remote ancestors were aware of something else also, namely that even when the sun at the end of this great 25,000 year period did return to its same place at the vernal equinox, the planets moving around the sun would not fall again into exactly the same patterns. In order to work out some phases of this particular subject, the Hindu astronomers developed some of their great world cycles, in which, for example, the uh, minimum unit, so to say, is 4,320,000 years. And from this foundation they built onward, until their calculations actually went into cycles going into the hundreds and thousands of millions of years. Now this sounds pretty good for people working as far back as they labored. For well, this system in Asia was well integrated long before the beginning of the Christian era, and some of their astronomer scientists claim that the true motion and cycles of these great years were known in India nearly a million years ago. Perhaps the million years is rather, uh, shall we say, symbolic, but certainly they did possess this knowledge long before anything comparable to it was known among Western peoples. Now, on the basis of this great cyclic concept of the world year, it was conceivable uh, that it would be possible uh, to make long-range predictions. 
These long-range predictions would involve not only the motion and position of the sun at the equinox, but also the calculation of the planetary positions throughout all this period of time. And it was also noted that in a certain vast number of years, the planets themselves came back to a pattern or, per or arrangement of similar duration or similar place in the sky. This, however, required a vast cycle of time, many, many times the great platonic year. Also, they realized that there was a motion continuously going on of the fixed stars, that these which were really great suns in space made their contributions. And even in the platonic year, when the sun, by procession at the vernal equinox, caused the equinox to occur in conjunction with a great fixed star. This likewise uh, resulted in a major modification or mutation in world patterns. Now these people were not of the opinion that these changes brought about by these motions were aimed at human beings. Uh, the, they did not uh, think of, the, of these different arrangements as forming natal horoscopes of persons. They did not assume, for example, in these calculations that man was essentially very important. Actually, what they were doing was to create what they termed a concept of the universal climate of nature. They came to the conclusion, as Plato did, that these great motions produced alternate periods of fertility and sterility in the solar system, and in a lesser way on the planet in which we exist. That these different cycles meant that in some times men would rise to great idealistic heights. There would be golden ages and silver ages, and ages of copper and brass, and ages of iron. These different divisions would be represented in cultures. There would be times when men's progress, along with the rest of nature, would be vitalized by a great fertility of life energy. In these periods of fertility, uh, energies would express themselves uh, in, along creative lines consistent with the nature of the universal positions. We look back upon the surface of the earth and its mutations, and we see some of the evidences of this. We look back to the cycle of the great stone builders of Egypt and other nations, where vast monolithic structures were raised, where the pyramids were built, where wonderful monuments rose everywhere on earth, representing prodigious skill and inconceivable labor. We also realize that after a while no more such monuments were built. The moods of men changed, and all that remains now of these classic monuments is their ruin in the deserts of the world. It would be a mistake, however, to assume that these great forces of life limited monument building to the valley of the Nile. We used to think so, but we do not anymore. We realize that the great pyramids of San Juan Teotihuacan in Mexico were built about the same time, and we have recently discovered great pyramids similar to those in Egypt in the heart of China. <coughs> this period was a period of great world emphasis upon something, emphasis upon a certain type of cultural achievement. We all can also date the rise of Western philosophy. We wonder sometimes why the 6th century B.C. should have produced such a prodigious group of world thinkers. We wonder how it happened that Buddha and Confucius and Lao Tzu and the last of the Zoroasters, Pythagoras and many others, were alive at the same time. We know that this was a period of great uh, religious and philosophic insight, and then this period slowly faded out, and today most of the religions of the world trace their origins to periods long ago. Great religions such as those of that time are not now being fashioned. We can also observe in Europe the motion of music, the great uh, period of composers of Bach and Beethoven. We see a tremendous creativity in music, and then this slowly fades away into a consistent mediocrity. 
all of these different cycles seem to tell us that there are rules and regulations somewhere in space, that these rules and regulations have to do with the psychological integration of nature, and man as a part of nature feels these pressures, and according to the qualities of these pressures, he creates his own cultures or tears them down. Thus there seems to be a long-range pattern, a pattern uh, which must <coughs> not exactly repeat itself. It moves not in a circle, but in a cycle, and the circle is prevented from remaining uh, on a level by the involved motions of planets within the structure of the solar arc. So here we have what appeared to many people of old times uh, to be a great clock, a great system by means of which we could anticipate, at least in general, the great changes of the world. Also, by the same rules, these changes could be applied uh, to the more detailed affairs of human nature, not because they were limited to them, but because man, being a particular kind of creature, uh, could discover how these changes applied to him, how they applied to the structures that he created socially, how they applied to the unfoldment of his history, his art, his literature, his philosophy, religion, science, and industry. And he was more and more convinced of the truth of these things as the historical records of Western man were perfected, and it was possible to establish at least a reasonable picture of the philosophy of history itself and how this applied uh, to the changing moods of cultures, moods which were very difficult to analyze by the common methods which we have tried to use. Now, realizing that each of the uh, great Platonic years uh, does divide into these subdivisions, which we might call ages, then uh, we also know from old calculation that the part of the uh, great planet, uh, the great platonic cycle through which we are passing now has been called the Piscean Age. The Piscean Age simply meaning that the vernal equinox occurs in the sign of Pisces, that the sun reaching the equinox each year by the motion of precession retires through the sign at the rate of one degree every 72 years, so that it takes something over 2,000 years for the sun to move on and bring the vernal equinox into the next sign, which in this case will be the next preceding sign, Aquarius. Now in popular thinking today, we hear a great deal of what is called the Aquarian Age. We have thought, heard about it, we have read about it, and some people have looked forward to these changes with the greatest hope, that a newer and better age would be likely to arise in the world. The great question then arose as to how to determine uh, the time in which the sun made the change uh, from the first degree of Aries to the last degree of Pisces. And uh, for a long time, the popular mind and the folk mind cannot be ignored as an instrument in science, has associated this transition with the rise of Christianity. In other words, even the scriptures themselves seem to tell us something of this moment when the vernal equinox passed from the sign of the lamb or ram to the sign of the fishes. We remember the biblical references to the Messiah, where he is referred to as the Lamb of God and the Fisher of Men. Here we seem to stand on the uh, joining point of the two great signs, uh, we, each of which uh, has its uh, rulership over the world for something over 2,000 years. And in the same uh, context, we seem to see or sense some kind of New Testament prophecy about the future. For example, at the time of the Last Supper, uh, Jesus told his disciple to go into the town, and there to find a man 
carrying a jug of water on his shoulder. And when this man entered the, a house, the disciples were to go to that house and reserve the upper room for the master and his followers for the celebration of the Passover. Now in the ancient pageantry of the heavens, the sign of Aquarius was the sign of a man with a water jug on his shoulder. It has been so symbolized for a long time. Therefore it seemed as though uh, this passing over uh, could be a key to the passing of the vernal equinox from Pisces to Aquarius, from the sign of the fishes uh, to the sign uh, of the water bearer. Now we have also to bear in mind that there are a good many present opinions concerning the dating of the Aquarian age. And I don't want to conflict with anybody's feelings on this type of subject. This isn't our purpose at all. But if we uh, attempt uh, to use the, uh, the popular belief or feeling uh, that this does coincide with the rise of Christendom, then we are confronted with only two possibilities. One, that the vernal equinox moved into the sign of uh, Pisces uh, at about the time of the birth of Christ. Or perhaps we could vary it slightly to the time of his ministry or death. This would give us one possible starting point. But if we take that approved date and we add to it the period as indicated here of 2160 uh, calendar years, we still do not bring the equinox into the sign of Aquarius. So this would not do. We would have to choose as a date, an arbitrary one, prior to the birth of Christ. This does not seem to fulfill any of the specific needs of, the, of calculation. For nearly always this transition, uh, which is a kind of great Passover, not just the annual Passover, but the motion of the sun from one sign to another. This moving over, or this great change, nearly always means a major event of some kind. And it is difficult for us to arrange a major event bearing upon Christendom that would permit us to already be in the Aquarian age. The main problem would then be simply how much longer do we have to wait for this transition? Not that we are already there. According to most astronomers and according to many Eastern calculations, the equinox is now taking place in the tail of one of the fishes, uh, that is, in the constellation, which would mean that it is still in the sign of the fishes. And this has been uh, more or less generally accepted on an astronomical level. Of course, the astronomers do not make much reference to these uh, issues, such as the Platonic year, but they still have to take them into consideration, for they have found no equally appropriate way of making the larger divisions of astronomical phenomena. Now, it seems that there is one possibility that has generally been overlooked, and that is to choose the time when Christianity actually became a world religion. That this uh, actually was the beginning of Christendom. Prior to this time, Christendom was essentially regarded throughout the Near East merely as a reform Judaism. Uh, Jesus was considered to be merely a reformer, uh, one who brought about certain uh, changes in policy who brought new vision and new purpose, but it was held as a basic concept that his own words were true, namely that he came to fulfill the prophets and not to destroy them. So up to the time of the Council of Nicaea, uh, Christianity did not exist as a sovereign entity in itself. It was at the time when Constantine chose to acknowledge Christianity as the dominant religious power of the Roman Empire, the Christendom as we know it, as a sovereignty in religion, as a sovereignty gradually even in mundane affairs, uh, was created. 
So for the purposes of seeking out a key to the great cycle of the Platonic year, I took uh, time and trouble to take the possibility uh, that the beginning of the Piscean Age was 325 A.D., the time of the great council of Nicaea, at which time uh, the most important episode, the most dynamic event, other than the life of Christ itself, uh, came to influence and dominate Western thought. From that very day, from the council of Nicaea, the vast organization and diffusion of Christianity began. It was at that time that its spiritual and temporal powers uh, came to be generally recognized. So on this basis, it was uh, possible and reasonable to set up these calculations. The moment these calculations were set up, we followed both the Eastern and Western methods of dividing uh, a sign of the zodiac, in this case the Piscean sign, into all of its subdivisions suitable for calculation. In other words, each sign in ancient thinking had a positive and negative half, therefore a sign consisting uh, theoretically of 30 degrees, uh, consisted of 30 72-year periods. These, however, could also be grouped uh, into larger patterns. One-third of a sign, uh, consisting of 10 degrees, belonged to one division, was called a decan. This, in turn, could be further divided, each decan into half, making six five-degree intervals called dodecans. These each had their own planetary rulers. They each had their own uh, particular stars or constellational groups associated with them in the northern and southern hemispheres. They each had fixed stars within them. Uh, and the conjunction of the equinox with these fixed stars became important guides. But the main problem from the beginning was to see whether it would be possible to make such an assignment, uh, to lay, for instance, this pattern on the pattern of history and find that we had something of interest to work with. Uh, working with it also, at that time, I was doing a great deal of research on the quatrains of Nostradamus. It was obvious that some major pattern of prediction dominated his work that part of this prop pattern might have been mystical or magical is indicated from his own writings. But his uh, reasonably frequent references to planetary positions and to the motions of planets indicated that he also included this circumstance. The extraordinary accuracy of Nostradamus uh, presents problems which even now can only be very lightly considered. We cannot uh, without far more research than the world has yet felt inclined to expend on this subject, uh, for instance, discover how he was able to prophesy not only events, but the names of the persons who would not be born for a thousand years or five hundred years after his death. These predictions begin to transcend almost any kind of system that we know, yet a system must exist or the predictions could not exist. We cannot predict what is going to happen in a vacuum. There has to be elements and factors there which respond to something, which order themselves in some way. There must be archetypal structures in the universe which have a bearing upon the unfoldment of world events. Unless such patterns exist, all prophecy, all prediction, all foreknowledge uh, would be futi futil futility. Even intuitive foreknowledge uh, could not have any real significance unless there was something to intuit, unless the patterns themselves were valid. Man could not discover them either by inspiration or by mathematics. There had to be something to discover. So out of this pattern we took the concept of the age of the fishes, beginning with the uh, idea of the Council of Nicaea, and I set up a basic chart to cover this point, uh, the chart having in its essential meaning uh, the 
dis uh, the distribution of history according to the cyclic subdivision of the sign of the fishes. Now, we, as we mentioned to you, uh, the sign, all signs of the zodiac, for personal calculation or for mundane calculation, have these divisions into which they can be subdivided within themselves. And the great division of this nature, uh, the first division, is to divide the sign in half. That would be half of the number of years required for the uh, complete cycle of an age, half the number of degrees made up of a, making up a sign, 30 degrees, half is 15. So arbitrarily, we simply transformed uh, the calendar to the beginning of the so-called Piscean Age at the time of the Council of Nicaea, extended it for the duration of the Piscean Age as astronomically known, extending it in the form of dates in history or into the future. We cut it directly in half at the middle, allowing one half of the sign exactly, and the half fell on the year assigned by all historians for the Renaissance. Now this is, I think, a very valid point, because it was the motion from one half of a sign to the other, the motion that always carries the sun either from positive to negative or negative to positive, according to the cycle itself, and that it should fall to the exact year would seem to imply that we were somewhere on the track of something. That here we had uh, the first half of the age of the fishes ending at the Renaissance, which of course uh, really was the great turning point, not only of Western history, but of Christian history. It was from the Renaissance that the great changes began, which finally and then not too long a period of time resulted in the Reformation. And the Reformation was the great schism, the great division within the structure of Christianity itself. The Reformation was no accident and no incident. It represented a new point of view toward Christianity. It did not destroy Christianity. It simply transformed it uh, from a great feudal structure into what we might term today a democratic religious institution. This was the most important thing that ever happened to Christianity. And it might well, therefore, be proper to assume that it would occur in exactly the center or the point of equilibrium before between the involutionary and evolutionary halves of a sign. It was, it was its most proper point. Now, assuming that we were somewhere near correct on this particular period of time, we then proceeded to divide the cycle into uh, the division of the dodecans, or one-sixth of the period of a platonic month, of a platonic year. And from this, we got some very, very interesting dates, which I think that uh, we can adjust and we adjusted them by means of keywords. In other words, we used the same keywords exactly that would be used in interpreting a personal nativity, or the nativity of a nation established more recently, or the nativity of events in electional, or mundane, or horary astrology. And we came in with some other interesting and delightful figures that seem to have a strong and reasonable bearing upon world conditions. So the first sixth of the sign uh, was assigned by us to what might be termed the rise of Christianity, dating from 325 A.D. to 684 A.D. Now 684 A.D., is an interesting date, for it not only represents what might be termed uh, the circumference of the rise of early Christianity, but it also created the first major adversary of Christianity, for it corresponds almost exactly with the rise of Islam. 
which became the first major uh, boundary upon the growth of the Christian church. The second period of time, extending from 685 A.D. to 1044, uh, we found to be a Pisces negative subdivision. And what does it correspond with? Almost to the days, the Dark Ages. <clears throat> the Dark Ages extending from the fall of the Roman Empire uh, to what we call now the beginning of the Crusades. During the Dark Ages, we find some important constructive events occurring. But it is interesting that under Pisces, for example, a highly religious, a highly mystical, a highly intuitive uh, sign, we should find the period of the creation of the idea or doctrine of canonization and of the veneration of the dead. All of this seems to uh, tie very closely to our major problem. For our third subdivision of the uh, five degrees within the great cyclic e uh, age of Pisces, we chose the period from 1045 to 1404. 1045 to 1404 corresponds almost exactly at its beginning with the cycle of the Crusades. Therefore, we have called it the cycle of the Crusades. Within this cycle also, we find the growth of scholasticism. We find in the very middle of it the great crusade of Richard the Lionhearted. We find following this the beginning of the revival of ancient learning. And uh, at the end of this cycle, at 1404, we find what is called in history the vanguard of the Renaissance. This vanguard being led by Petrarch, Boccaccio, and Chaucer. This was the beginning of the rise of letters. 1404 to 1405, that one year, is called the Renaissance. In other words, it was at that moment that this motion began. And at this moment, we have reached the last of the first half of our sign, three out of six minor divisions. Beyond this, we come to a new cycle, which of course contains the Renaissance and all that refers to it. This was the great era, which I have called for practical purposes, the era of the explorations. Uh, these explorations were of the world and of the mind. They were explorations of far places and of unknown realities. And this cycle of exploration extends from 1405 to 1764. It is interesting that the earliest example of woodblock cut printing that we know in Europe actually was made about 1405. It was the beginning of reading and writing for the people. It was the beginning of the opening of uh, the minds of people. The next minor subdivision within this cycle covers the period of the great explorers. Columbus, Vespucci, Magellan, Balboa, and De Soto. All of them were operating within this period of the so-called uh, rise of explorations. This period also corres corresponds or contains within it about the years between 1549 and 1620 uh, the great intellectual inquisition, the great opposition of learning, the great frustration of the human mind, uh, the fight against knowledge, the armament of the old and the new locked in a tremendous struggle for survival, uh, the tremendous rise of guilt mechanisms, uh, the unfoldment of extraordinary intellectual tensions throughout the world. Now, whether there was any relation between this great psychological upheaval and health, we cannot know for certain, but this was the period of the Great Plagues which may have had more uh, than a passing significance. 
The, this subdivision of the period of the Great Plagues ended in 1620, although there were epidemics after that time. None of them reached the proportions of the earlier ones. So we have a new division beginning within the major division in the year 1621, which is one of the key years in this great predictional process. And in 1621, Bacon issued the Novum Organum, which was the first text of modern science. This we see, again, a struggle toward uh, the release of man from intellectual uh, slavery and things of that nature. Also, we find within this uh, rise at the very end of the period of exploration, the rise of corporations and corporate structures in Europe, uh, what we call the modern political power of business, came into existence. And this particular uh, great five-degree cycle uh, therefore ended in 1764. At that time, uh, the five-degree uh, cycle uh, fell under the keeping of Sagittarius, became the keynote. And following the old systems, I call this division the period of the liberations. Now, the period of the liberations falls very, very closely to many things which we know, for actually, if the truth were known, we are still in it. And the period of the liberations extended, therefore, from 1765 up through our present time to the year 2124 A.D. This would be called the period of the liberations. The uh, first immediate effect of this, you see, it began in 1765. This corresponds almost exactly with the first pre-revolutionary agitations of the American colonies. It was at this time that we very, very closely escaped a, a war with England. We did not, however, come to it at that time. But within that first little subdivision, from 1765 to 1836, we have the great periods of the revolutions. Not only the revolutions in America, but in France, and also the great cycle of the Napoleonic Wars. All these were processes of breaking down uh, the great uh, autonomies of autocracy, which had previously controlled the world. Uh, from this period, we uh, go on to the next uh, great cycle within this, extending from 1837 to 1908. The large part of this period has been covered by what is called the Victorian epic, or the Victorian regime in uh, not only England, but by extension uh, throughout most of the Western worlds. During this period, we had the vast expansion of empires. We had a tremendous growth uh, in, and rise in all of the various situations relating to the extension of knowledge about foreign powers. And this cycle extends, of course, from 1837 to 1908, which is a very clear statement inasmuch as during this time, we had the ascendancy of science over religion, represented by Sagittarius, uh, the great, uh, uh, we will say, renaissance of conservative culture under the Victorian era, and also under Sagittarius and the Age of Liberation, all the great motions against slavery. Uh, these all moved together and continued on down to uh, 1908. From 1909 to 1952, we also had another major cycle. Uh, this, uh, this cycle uh, has to do now with uh, the general changes taking place in world society. It has to do with the great cycle of wars through which we have already passed. It has to do with certain rises of arts, cultures, and literature we have this pretty well balanced because from 1909 to 1952 carries us actually from the beginnings of the disturbances in the Balkans, which led to the Balkan War, 
and the wars in the Near East, uh, such as the famous story of the overwhelming of Armenia by Turkey, and things of this nature, all the way down through the two major world wars, and the date of 1952 is very closely associated with the further development from its more or less humble beginnings of nuclear fission. Uh, this uh, dates very closely to this period. From 1952 to 1981, we find uh, a, a cycle which has very heavy emphasis uh, upon uh, what we would term labor, labor disputes, uh, organization of working conditions, uh, rebellion against working limitations, the rise of proletariats everywhere, and uh, because of the fact that this uh, uh, general uh, pattern of 1981 on uh, carries a Virgo rulership, we may also realize that Virgo rules communism. Uh, thus we have a great problem of struggle and difficulty at that particular cycle. The last division of this cycle uh, of this cycle, or the cycle of liberation, uh, extends from 2053 A.D. to 2124, and is under the rulership of Leo. This corresponds with Nostradamus' dating for what he called the coming of the world king of peace. That he should have chosen Leo for this, it would be consistent with the entire uh, concept. Uh, the period is key to temporal or temporary stability. It, it has to do with the gradual gathering up of the various forces of society toward the establishment of an enduring civilization of some kind, something that is not subject to the constant plaguing with which we are familiar. This leaves the last of the five-degree divisions of the Piscean Age, to extend from 2125 A.D. to 2485 A.D., which is the end of the age, and at which time the vernal equinox should pass to Aquarius. Uh, this, of course, we cannot fully distinguish, uh, but from the general keynote of the signs and of the rulership, I have assigned to this particular period uh, the period of restorations. Uh, the, uh, the period uh, of the bringing together of all of the achievements and accomplishments of an age. This is uh, the ancient belief about it and would seem to have reasonable stability. So we, we divide the, the age itself into its six major parts. And we find that so far as we can carry these parts, historically, they have been completely consistent. Uh, where we are not yet able to carry them historically, uh, we have to, of course, uh, uh, try to assume or to consider or to explore the reasonable probabilities and hope that we are able to be reasonable. Now, within each of the 72-year periods which make up uh, one of the major divisions, uh, we have a further breaking down into a zodiac. 72 breaks down into a zodiac of 12 signs, each governing six years. We become uh, more and more directly uh, relating to events within our comprehension. Uh, I would like to point out that this publication was printed in 19, uh, first printed in 1942. We have put out a new edition of it, but we have made no changes in the original except a few editorial corrections for spelling or for punctuation or to correct an awkward word. No meaning change exists, and all changes that have been made uh, involving new material have been inserted in italics so that there is no question as to the original intention. In 1942, therefore, referring to that particular Aries six-year cycle, 
which controlled at that time, we said as follows. Uh, Ares is ruled by Mars, the ancient god of war. And according to these divisions, a period of war will have exist from 1939 to 1945, at which time the equinox will move into the retributional sign of Pisces. So that in 1942, from this arrangement, we decided that the war would end in 1945. It did end in 1945, which adds a small pinpoint of accuracy to the large pattern of things, seemingly indicating that the structure is essentially sound. Now, if the structure is essentially sound, then we can definitely, finally, break the entire structure down into single-year periods. This is, of course, a little more tricky, but it can definitely be done. In the original edition of the uh, work, we broke down the period from 1939 uh, to 1945 uh, in detail to show several points that seemed to be of the greatest importance. And we tied as far as we could. We could only go up to 1942 at that time tied these events to historical circumstances that had actually occurred. Now, one of the points that is very interesting is that six-year cycles uh, repeat themselves with some frequency during the period of a great cycle. Therefore, we have a number of occasions in which similar uh, positions of planets can be estimated in order to see what was happening. We mentioned the six-year Aries cycle from 1939 to 1945. So we went back a little bit to see what happened in the previous, immediately previous, uh, six-year Aries cycles. There was an Aries cycle of six years from 1741 to 1746. This corresponded with the rise of Frederick the Great, and was consummated by an alliance between England, Austria, Saxony, and Holland against Prussia. This was an interesting thing. In eight, uh, that was an, a, in a similar uh, subdivision of six years with the same general ruler. This indicated uh, something that seems to me rather interesting. In 1873 to 1879, there was another Aries subcycle. This corresponds exactly with the ascendancy of Prince Otto von Bismarck, Chancellor of the Prussian State. In, eight, in 1878, at the Congress of Berlin, the entire map of Europe was reconstructed according to Bismarck's pleasure. The same countries involved in 1741 to 46 and in 1873 to 1879, the two preceding cycles, were also the ones involved in the 1939 to 1945 cycle, including, among others, Romania, Bulgaria, Greece, Austria, Russia, Montenegro, Serbia, now Yugoslavia, and the other nations that we generally know. Therefore, we find that when this cycle comes along, we have similar alignments of powers, we have similar dangers of war, we have similar types of outcomes. And while it's not possible in a brief outline to take every single date and follow this pattern, there seems to be no doubt whatever that it could be done. And that we would discover, therefore, that we have discovered perhaps the minute and second hands on a large clock. And that these various predictions are quite within the range of possibility that they should not be too highly specialized, I am definitely certain. But that they can be generalized, I don't believe uh, we can doubt. The final interpretations of these things would require a great deal of thought. Uh, but I believe that they are very well worth uh, consideration. Now, from the period of 19... 63 to 1968, which is the period we are now in. We are in a Sagittarian sub-cycle of six years. 
this Sagittarian subcycle, uh, it seems therefore, should be expected to follow the general pattern of previous probabilities. So in this, uh, we are able, of course, only to consider, at the time this went to print last November, certain events in 1963. But these events in 1963, such as we were able uh, to point out, uh, involved the usual Sagittarian problems. And these usual Sagittarian problems were always, you see, Sagittarius governs the ninth house in the ancient astrology system, which has to do with religious tolerance, with racial integration, improvement of political understandings among nations. Also, the sign near the latter part of itself in this 1963 years, year fell into a very negative and destructive segment uh, with emphasis upon sorrow, misfortune, mourning, and death. But I think we should bear in mind that during this year, Sagittarius year, there was a rift between Russia and China, which, uh, by the way, geographically and uh, geophysically, the sign of Sagittarius falls largely on that area of the world. Uh, there was the powerful effort of Pope John to create religious understanding. Uh, there was the disastrous condition in Vietnam. There was a uh, emphasis upon medical care for the aged and other matters of this type. Uh, the year was loaded with disasters of all kinds, including natural disasters, floods, mine and railroad accidents. And when the uh, uh, emphasis upon the Aquarian degree came, uh, we had the political upsets, we had the anarchy, we had the difficulties associated with that position. Now in 1964, which is with us at the present time, uh, we have a degree that is ruled by Leo. This means that 1964 will certainly be dominated largely uh, by the uh, various problems arising among the heads of nations and of states. In other words, this is a year in which leaders uh, will uh, lead in many directions, where we certainly will expect unpopularity to arise among leaders, difficulties due to the headstrong and uncontrollable uh, tyrannies of individuals, uh, the continuation of unsettled financial conditions, and uh, ups and downs, but not too seriously down under a Leo year. In the second half of the year, decisions involving religion, higher education, and physical sciences will arise. Fires threaten. Further progresses in communication will be noted, and efforts to prevent technological unemployment. These are the key words relating to the various subdivisions of the year according to the major division. In 1965, we have a rather dangerous year, with Eastern Asia and the Near East under extreme pressure. Financial relations among nations strained, conspiracies in high places, accidents occur in programs of scientific research, the United States becomes more de in deeply involved in foreign political crises. There is some danger of a war breaking out somewhere of major importance, but I think a good chance that it can be averted. <coughs> Important legal reforms will be attempted, possible changes in divorce laws, and there will be a new and powerful alliance created among a group of nations uh, that feel the present existing alliances are not adequate. 1966 brings with it under the same reading labor problems in the first half of the year, internal feuding between various groups, the strikes and legislations involving labor, structure of national defenses will be re-examined, resulting in considerable discord, 
Public health programs will be given greater publicity. Scandals will impel reforms in theater, arts, television, literature, and things of this nature. Religion and political pressures in Italy and France. Curbs on speculation and financial adjustments. Various monarchies or dictatorships face internal difficulties. Greater emphasis will be focused upon the solution of juvenile delinquency. In 1967, there will be a period of extreme stress in American politics. Strong dissatisfactions also among governments in other nations. Agitations of unusual magnitude may be expected in China, Africa, and the East Indies. There may be another unseasonal year affecting health and crops. The United States will have to take a stronger and firmer attitude in world affairs. There will be international disputes over territorial rights. Uh, there will be a tendency for money to tighten in the latter part of 67. Internal security endangered by too much publicity or too much uh, uh, talking where it isn't best. Railroads will be in need of further help. Dangerous from cyclones and tidal waves. 1968, which closes this particular year, also has uh, some part to tell us in this. 1968 opens with great emphasis upon economy. Curtailment of support of foreign nations probable. Political image not good. Minor threats of war, but not major outbreaks. Stock exchange under uh, tremendous pressure. Trouble in Persia, Greece, and Russia. Turkey takes an important place in the news. Monetary system under pressure. Later in the year, the British Commonwealth, Germany, and Japan are subject to internal difficulties. There may be serious outbreaks in the communist satellite states. Nationalism increases in many parts of the world. Public health receives fresh attention. General increase of aggressiveness, but a major war not likely. Now that would be the, sub, the subdivisions for the minor period of 1963 to 1968. Theoretically, this type of advanced calculation can be continued to the end of the Piscean cycle or age. As far as that's concerned, by mathematics, it can be extended into the next major cycle. Now, there's only one way in which a problem of this kind can be more or less decided, and that is through observation, reflection, experimentation. If, as it seems quite possible, this is at least a part of the key that was used by the astrologers of the Middle Ages in their extraordinary long-range prophecy, then it could well mean that a prophetic science of government could be established. If this cycle could be demonstrated by scholarly and scientific examination, uh, to have a basic validity, we would be in possession of a fair concept of the danger areas of each of the cyclic periods to come and even of the separate years. Theoretically and factually, if you wish to become sufficiently involved in a very long and tedious project, you could actually break this down to separate days. If the cycle itself is correct, all of the sub-cycles within it must operate. Now, it is rather interesting to realize that in a number of parts of the world, uh, most astrological calculations are made by cycles rather than by reference to the position of planets as we use them uh, in Western astrology. For example, in Tibet, all astrology was calculated according to involved groups of cycles. The astrologer was not even interested in the location of the planets at the time of the events. He was working entirely from an arbitrary basis of general calculation. He had cycles of years that met and interrelated, and some group of cycles came together each year to form what he would regard as a keynote. Uh, when Sir Francis' young husband led his military expedition into Tibet, he was astonished to find that the Tibetan almanac for that year, issued long before the campaign was anticipated, announced his coming. They knew he was coming because the planets indicated it. 
but not planets calculated for an hour and moment of event, but entirely by their own method of cycles, in which things occur according to the relationship of the larger divisions of time. And that uh, where these divisions meet in certain patterns, the event was to be predicted. While I was in Darjeeling many years ago, I happened to meet a very interesting man who was uh, accredited as being a, a very outstanding musician. Uh, he was complaining to me bitterly of one circumstance, namely uh, that he had good criticisms, good recognition for skill, but every uh, critic had said the same thing of him, namely that his, his music lacked warmth. It lacked feeling. It was too much like uh, a player piano. Uh, it did not have a personal touch uh, to it. Uh, one day, uh, while we were in Darjeeling, one of these itinerant, um, we'll say, astrologer computers came along. A kind of a strange person who worked with these cycles. He laid a piece of cloth divided into all kinds of divisions on the floor. Then he took stones and buttons and beams of different color and laid them on each of these different squares, uh, perhaps to measure the, the occasion on, or time on which this man came to him. My friend said, let's have our fortunes told. So this native certainly did not know my friend. In fact, the, mem the other people in the hotel did not know he was a musician. It was a confidential discussion with me. I've always been the victim of these things. <laughs> in any event, this man, this Tibetan, who had very poor English, worked his little buttons and beads around for a few minutes, and then he uh, turned and punched this man in the stomach with his finger, not too hard, not to cause damage, but like this, he said, you, you in music, you very good, but you have no soul, <laughs> which is exactly what the critics had said. It didn't mean the man was soulless in the psychological sense, but his music did not have any soul. So with his beans and his buttons, this man came to the same conclusion as the music critics of the New York Times. These things were done without any calculation for an hour of birth. He didn't ask this man when he was born or anything about it. It was done by the incident of the time this man came to him, and as this fitted into the great cycles with which his art was involved. Chinese astrology is on the same basis. It is based upon cycles, not upon uh, the position of planets in the sky. To a large degree, Hindu astrology used to be, although some have become more modern and used our way. Uh, Japanese astrology in the old times and Korean was also, were also done entirely by cycles. And these cycles in the East are derived not so much from the astrological speculation as from the cosmological concepts. These cycles were the great periods of time. Uh, in the... Uh, uh, the Aztecs and Mayas of the Central American area also practiced divination by cycles. They had a work which they believed or attributed to have been delivered to them at the beginning by the deity Quetzalcoatl, and this book called the Tonalamatl was a book of cycles, of periods of time, of minor divisions that repeated themselves indefinitely. And by means of these minor divisions, the pro predictions and prognostications were made, not only for individuals, but for the state, for the seasons, for the passing of time, for the great problems of life. And it was one of these uh, stargazer sages of the ancient Aztec Empire who warned Montezuma of the coming of the Spaniards long before they arrived, and warned him also that the men wearing uh, tin hats or tin cans on their heads would ultimately destroy the Aztec Empire. So that uh, some way these cyclic patterns seem to work. There is only one way in which they can work, and that is that there has to be 
some definite relationship between the major divisions of the uh, astronomical theory and uh, the events or occasions in the world. It is not likely or reasonable to assume that because a comet hung over the city of Jerusalem at the time it fell, that the comet itself caused the fall of Jerusalem, any more than a similar comet hanging over Mexico City resulted in the fall of Mexico City. Both phenomena are noted in the ancient records. But one thing is true, the cycle of the comets has something to do with mundane affairs, always eccentric, always difficult, always dangerous. So that uh, the large pattern of the recurrences of motions were used to discover, for instance, in India, the Kali Yuga, or the beginning of the Dark Age in which we now exist. Uh, they were major divisions to show the destinies of men. One of the keynotes of the Kali Yuga in India, which is the minor, the minor division of time, not too minor, a mere 432,000 years, uh, uh, is a division in time which will be dominated by a single keynote. And we know what that keynote is, perhaps better than the Hindu ever realized. For the keynote that they gave was that every man who has an elephant will be called a Raja. In other words, the keynote was the belief that security, hope, future, power, everything rested in worldly possession. This was to be the keynote of the Kali Yuga, and if that is true, we're in it. The only difficulty is how long will it take us to get out of it. All these different calculations, however, add together to make a very interesting pattern. And I think that many persons who have a little leisure or a little research instinct within themselves, uh, could contribute to the development of the major concept, which, of course, in the West is tied directly to the Platonic year. That this concept can be a, a timetable of the world, and that what we call the things that happen to men, the affairs of nations, are merely one interpretation of energy. And this uh, leads us to something else, which again uh, we might have to give more thought to. Uh, today we are surrounded by an infinite diversity of intangibles. Intangibles that move in upon us in a most powerful way. Uh, for instance, our biological researches and our biological drugs are creating a major crisis in life. We are, we are engaged in a warfare against nature. And nature in itself apparently has its own energies with which to retaliate. And uh, the misuse or abuses of natural energy uh, may go along for a while, and then all of a sudden something explodes in our faces. Why is this? Is it simply accumulation or is it true that the same power which might cause the fall of Adolf Hitler could also, in a mysterious way, contribute to the rise or decrease of certain ailments, certain diseases, could cause uh, tensions within government, uh, could cause all kinds of unexpected situations to arise, simply because energy in man works out one way. This same energy in nature works out in other ways. Storms, natural disasters, also perhaps uh, the rise of energies by means of which the individual can combat the natural problems of his time. Great cycles of idealism nearly always follow cycles of realism. We are now in, an, uh, in a declining cycle of realism. We are becoming less and less satisfied with materialism. Plato might say that the reason why we are less satisfied with the obvious is because we are receiving more creative energy. That this creative energy will ultimately cause us to become more creative. The mind will be more active. The inner sensibilities will be more acute. The individual will have greater sense of his own needs. And under the pressure of a rising sense of self-value, the individual may make reforms 
or changes that will bring solutions to many of the problems of life. Under these same processes and these same ways, there will be mutations in crops, there will be changes in weather. Many different things will happen. But to man, almost all of these forces are interpreted in terms of his own history, in his own survival, and in the perpetuation of the institutions which he has created and which he regards as necessary for his own survival. If we can, therefore, uh, actually recognize this situation, we may be better armed. The Piscean Age is so named because of the sign uh, where the sun uh, makes its annual processional entry. The Piscean Age has always been regarded by the ancients uh, as an age of consequences. It is an age in which the laws of cause and effect are keenly operating. In the Chinese system, it was called the time of the deluge. It is the period in which all old things must finally pass away, including architecture on Bunker Hill. All these changes have to do with the gradual vanishing away of corruption, of negation, of ancient limitations and restrictions. The clearing of the way for something that is better. But Pisces is also a sign of retribution, a sign of limitation, of fears, anxieties, worries. And I think we can safely say that there has never been a more doleful period in history, as far particularly as Western man is concerned. Western man, perhaps more than Eastern man, set about uh, a way of life which caused immediate and tremendous retributional processes to come into focus. Western man has been a consistent lawbreaker since the beginning. He has placed his own ambitions first. He has considered his success in terms largely of his control and domination of other peoples. He has been intolerant in politics, religion, and philosophy. He has been materialistic and bigoted in most of his attitudes. And all of these things added together come to their culmination in this age, in which, as uh, the ancients pointed out, this is the age in which karma operates most immediately. And out of this karmic reaction, one of two things has to happen. Either this age goes down into a dismal oblivion, uh, represented by the ancient symbol of the deluge, the Maya sign of the great uh, Atal, or the age of waters, or the Chinese deluge, or the Indian deluge, across which the Indian Noor and his family were saved in the ark. But this sign is always the sign which we might follow the words of the king of France, after me the deluge. Uh, we are more or less thinking that way. Let's get what we can now. We won't be here in 50 years. The deluge will fall on somebody else. This type of attitude apparently has contributed a great deal of negation to our way of life, a negation that has something to do with the mundane interpretation of the sign of Pisces. Therefore, as Aquarius lying in the front to come, is the great age of true progress in science and the idealism. When these things which are now selfishly used will begin to be used for the common good, it is not unlikely or unreasonable uh, that we will survive to this better use, but that uh, we must look forward uh, trying to preserve values, trying to maintain individual and collective integrities so that the things that we are now developing will sometime bring with them the peace and prosperity and security and world well-being that we hope for. The sign of Aquarius is a sign of brotherly affection. It is a sign of concord. It is a sign of true progress. And uh, always Nostradamus seemed to point to that time as a golden age, a minor one, but an age of over 2,000 years in which man might be free from many of the difficulties and problems that now confront him. So all of these divisions, all of these patterns can be estimated, and I think something can be discovered among them that would be of the greatest value from a sociological standpoint in helping us not only to survive the present time, but to have the courage to look for a better future. Well, time is up, so we have to stop. 
Now, for the friends who couldn't be here this morning, we are repeating this lecture on Wednesday evening. I'd like to point out that next Sunday we have a very interesting study to make on the psychological keynotes of the living religions of mankind, as these are briefly summarized or pointed out by the contemporary historian Arnold Toynbee. This is a rather new and interesting approach to a valid subject of great interest, so I hope that as many as you can of you as can will be with us. In the library this morning, we have a brand new exhibit for your consideration. Uh, the exhibit consists of a number of very interesting Sumi paintings and drawings, originals, which I have been accumulating. They have to do with something which I called in a magazine article not long ago, the singing line. The, the power to draw a line. The power to put that line where you want it. To make that line straight or curved. To make that line heavy or light. Or to change it with your own moods. A free hand with a brush held vertically over a horizontal sheet of paper. This power can only come from a tremendous internal self-control. Uh, in the East, uh, the brush is said to be merely an extension of the fingers. The same life that moves in the hand is supposed to flow through the brush. It is part of a simple art technique uh, which Western artists have never been able to copy. The reason they've never been able to copy it according to Eastern thinking at least, is because they have never had the tremendous dynamic self-control. They were never taught from childhood to keep the rules. They were never taught as they grew up to be true to principles, uh, to maintain forever this wonderful discipline upon self, which is not a cause of misery or frustration, but a simple and direct means of expressing ourselves correctly, fully, and beautifully when the time comes. But anyway, these drawings, I think, will be of great interest to you. On display also are a number of Sumi drawings and pictures for those who might like to add something of that nature to their own personal collection. The major exhibit, of course, contains material that is not for sale. It represents, I think, one of the most interesting groups of 17th, 18th, and early 19th century originals that will be seen in this community. So we hope you will stop and look in the library. Also, don't forget the gift shop, because something new is coming in all the time. I'm always out scouting for things which I think are worthy of the interest of our people, and uh, every once in a while we find something which we think you will appreciate and enjoy. So don't uh, fail to visit uh, the gift shop. There are new things for you to look at. Our booklet, The Piscean Age, which I used in connection with the lecture this morning, is available on the book table. And if your mind runs to these things, I think you should give it further consideration. Lecture notes number 58, The Use and Abuse of Natural Psychic Powers, also available on the book table. And uh, for those who are interested in the philosophical side of uh, prediction, our little booklet, Astrology and Re Reincarnation, might fill a very interesting place. Not very much written available on that subject. So don't forget Wednesday and Sunday, and uh, we hope you will visit our exhibit and perhaps uh, tell your friends about it so that others can see what we feel to be a very substantial exhibit. Thank you very much.